Center on Research from uh, the Department of International Education in 2022. Um, you, you're probably seeing a message now that we are recording this session for those people who were, were not able to make it today. So our speaker today is uh, Margarita Pavlova. She's an associate professor in our departments, and she's also the director of the UNESCO Univoc Center here in Hong Kong. Uh, if you do not know um, Margarita as well as some of us do in the International Education Department, you will know her. I think she's sort of famous in our university community for her work on research impact. So her impact case study, uh, the inclusion of green skills and policy, TVET teaching and learning in Asia Pacific region was featured in the University Grants Committee publication on research impact in Hong Kong, uh, receiving four stars. Margarita has also won um, numerous research awards in the university for her work on research impact. So I was really excited for Margarita to give this presentation because um, I think we all want our research to make impact, but I'm never quite sure what impact means um, when it comes to presenting something accessible, convincing a research panel that your work has impact. Can educational research have impact and, and how can it have impact? So we've just asked Margarita to really share with us her experiences today, um, how she got involved in so many impactful projects, which she continues to be involved with. Hopefully we can get tips um, for those of us who'd like to have more impactful research in the future. Uh, so uh, I think we have uh, more than an hour and a half today or an hour and a half for total for this time. Uh, Margarita will talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for all sorts of questions um, about her research and her research journey with impact. Um, if you have questions, thinking about how to make your own research more impactful and so on. So I will hand over to Margarita. Um, thank you for thank you for giving this talk today. So go ahead. Oh, please, thank you very much for the introduction. And I will start sharing my PowerPoint so I can start my presentation. <clears throat> I hope you can see it okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, formal greetings. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk on that um, topic. So I am on one hand very excited, on the other hand, a little bit nervous because I never present on that. I just do the project with an impact. So it also gave me a chance to reflect on how did this happen. And I want to thank um, Liz, Tina, Will from our department who really encouraged me to do that. And also to thank Emily who was organizing this and she was so brilliant in remind me, reminding me about different things. And also thank you for Jasmine who helped me to make my PowerPoint beautiful. So um, today's seminar is based on my experiences that allowed me to achieve impact of my research. And um, I think that through my career, impact was embedded in my intentions in relation to research and development agenda. So today I will um, share these ideas. And also I noticed that we have a mix of uh, PhD students and academics. So of course you will have a different starting point to reflect on them, on my presentation. So this is the content areas I would like to address today. So uh, I think the first one is really important and I believe it's um, crucial to achieve an impact um, uh, of our research. And then we look at the knowledge transfer and then how we can um, write up our um, research and impact into the case studies that are required for um, uh, research and assessment exercises, and then how we can plan for impact and also some funding that is available at our university for knowledge transfer. So when um, we are thinking about mindset, I think it is a really important concept. And among others, the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research suggests that we need to focus on mindset, not on developing skills, because skills is more difficult to transfer from one context to another. 
but mindsets are always with us. So they really suggest that we need to do it through different levels of education. And um, of course, it, um, uh, you can see from these slides that um, mindset can be defined as an attitude, beliefs in values that influence what we are doing, how we can contribute. It also uh, shapes our ability to understand the world. And in our case will be the search environment and society that we want uh, to have an impact on. Also, it is a very deep psychological construct which influence our behavior and actions. And um, uh, you can see that it also can be conceptualized as a framework in which people understand and respond to the world. So I didn't do a lot of studies on um, mindset, but this is one diagram from the international we study across many countries where we're looking at the 15 year old um, school children. And uh, that particular study was focused on the 21st century skills. And we also conceptualized our survey based on the um, mindset. And you can see that there are four important um, categories here uh, that are purpose, hope, self-efficacy, and belonging. And uh, I think that when we're talking about our um, uh, research or impact of our research, these four categories are really important. And I will um, uh, illustrate that by one example later during later in my presentation. Oops, my slide. Um, research assessment um, exercise defines impact as valuable changes or advantages that our research um, brings to economy, society, culture, public policy or services. And it can be achieved at different levels, local, regional, international, but it should go beyond academia. And um, we need to look at them improving some aspects of life that is positive effects, or we can reduce um, the harmful or potentially harmful um, uh, events or um, context that uh, we can. Um, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, okay, take away all these um, small zoom images that block my screen. Yeah, that can cause them risk uh, and negative effects on society. So impact beyond academia that was um, highlighted and um, particularly it should go beyond the university where we are working in. So it should go beyond our students, beyond our academic staff. And it includes impact on teaching and students in other settings. Yes. So uh, we can influence not only broader society, but also students and um, teaching staff at different educational settings, but not at our university. And um, impact is the end product of this lengthy process that started from our research and then uh, um, for our projects, we identified beneficiaries. And then we are going through the stage of knowledge transfer. So how we transfer knowledge. And uh, I, I think that um, it is considered by our um, UGC as a third mission of the university. And I think it has been um, visualized like the third mission for quite some time. And it also uh, viewed as a two-way process. So universe, universities or academia contributes to societies. And then we're also learning from societies and that also contributes to our research. And here you can see the definition of the knowledge transfer, the systems and processes by which knowledge, including technology, know-how, expertise, and skills are transferred between higher education institutions and society. 
and that leads to innovation, economic and social improvements. There is a body of knowledge that relates to knowledge generation and transfer. And um, I think that the general framework that has been proposed in the early 90s um, and that was very well known is a triple helix model. So it conceptualized the government, academia and economic systems as contributing to each other. And the role of academia was conceptualized as generating, transferring and applying knowledge. But over the last two decades, the development of research in that area includes society as additional helix due to the changing nature of society and shifting it from um, industrial to knowledge society. And then due to environmental challenges, natural environment dimension was also added. So currently we have a quintuple model and you can see here how knowledge is generated and circulated uh, for the benefit of both nature and society. And uh, if um, you are interested in the international agenda, you know that um, sustainable development has been a focus um, for development of the countries for quite some time. And now we have sustainable development goals that majority of um, the countries signed for. So when we are talking about um, knowledge transfer, innovation, and um, the mindset. So the mindset should be related to this sustainable development framework. Yeah, so this is why we want to uh, improve our lives, our societies, environmental dimensions of our living. So I think that when we're talking about the knowledge generation and transfer, this is a good visual image that we um, can rely upon. And you can see it also related to the types of capital we have, human capital, economic capital, political and legal capital, information and social capital, environmental, naturally. And um, here my personal story now starts. In um, 1992, I finished my first PhD and um, this is the first book I published in the Soviet Union at that time. And my PhD was on um, the educational um, reform in um, UK. And I was um, sort of examining what's going on there and um, how teachers and students are responding to these changes. And then I designed the principles how we should reform our subject that was called labor education at that time. and. Um, it was a pure research because at that stage in the Soviet Union, all PhD studies, all sciences were split into the theoretical sciences and applied sciences. So my PhD was within this theoretical sciences. So it was no expectation that I would apply whatever I um, uh, researched or concluded with my study. But uh, on the contrary, if it is an applied research, for example, usually based on some sort of intervention, you are trying different methods of teaching or you're trying different methods of involving students in particular activities to improve the engagement, then it will be applied research and um, uh, you will measure the improvement and then uh, that should be um, implemented into practice. But, um, in my case, when I finished this study, no one was interested in my results. I'm in ministry, they didn't plan any reform. And when I was um, thinking that it would be so beneficial for Russia to change this um, subject, to apply different methods of teaching and learning. So no, no one was particularly interested. But because I really strongly believe in that, I decided that I should do something about that. So I, started to work with um, teachers in one region, the third biggest city in, in Russia, Nizhny Novgorod. 
And I still remember their faces when I had the first seminar with them talking about how we should change our approach towards teaching and learning. It was faces like full of horror. They couldn't understand anything I was talking about. It was contrary to the things they used to do in their classrooms. So it was just a feeling of what, what? But then gradually um, we developed a very good um, rapport with them and then tried these approaches in their classrooms and they saw the differences and kids' attitudes and creativity and innovation. So everything was good. And then we added another two um, regions. And because I couldn't find any real experts in that discipline, so I had a colleague from UK who helped me to do that. And um, we did it absolutely free because we just have a very strong belief that this is the worst thing to do, worthwhile thing to do. So our mindset sort of pushed us to do this. <clears throat> And then as a result, um, because it was successful across three regions, we have a very strong case to argue for the Ministry of Education. So they accepted our suggestion. And then we developed and published the textbooks based on our approach. And that has been in use uh, till uh, last year. So this year, I don't know, but last year it was still in use. And then you can <clears throat> imagine it impacted millions of students because from the middle 90s till 2021, how many students um, went through school. So when I moved to Australia, they, uh, Griffiths University, they used this case as their input case for the first research assessment exercise. And um, that was an easy one because you can measure it in this um, qualitative type of things, how many, textbooks were sold, so how many schools, how many students, you can estimate how many teachers were also affected. So I think that that uh, an example how impact can start from internal motivation. Yeah? So no one were talking about impact of research at that stage, but um, I just strongly believe in my ideas and then implemented them. And I think that the lessons that I learned from um, that case belongs to the dimensions of this mindset, of this framework I showed you at the beginning. So purpose, you really need to value what you do and you need to do it. And then hope you find a way how to do this. And uh, in that case, in the Russian case, it was not a straightforward way. So I couldn't go to the ministry and said, oh, this is a good idea. And they said, no. Oh. <laughs> and then um, self-efficacy, uh, you should believe in your success. And then belonging, you need to find people who support your ideas. And this is really important when you are introducing a real change into a um, particular environment. So now we are moving to our reality. Yes, and um, these are the five parts that um, impact case studies that university are submitting includes, and you can see it should be a brief summary of um, your case. Uh, it should be a description of your research that underpinned the impact. And then it should be references to your publications. And that part is also important, although it shouldn't be a plus journals or a journals, it should be referenced um, publications, refereed publications. And then the main part is a narrative. You need to demonstrate how your research led or underpinned the impact, who were the beneficiaries, then the nature of your impact, how it occurred or occurs and evidences that external to the university. And then these um, sources, you actually need to put some time to collect. Because of course, when I did my projects recently, I never thought that I would um, start submitting something like impact case study. So I contact people back and they were very happy to write the statement or provide the document. So at the end, it was um, more or less easy. And uh, 
there are two dimensions, yes, the reach and significance. And uh, when you are planning, if you want to plan for that, you need to, to think about the extent or the breadth of beneficiaries and also the significance, how significant is the change that you are proposing to the organizations or uh, policies or practices of the particular organizations. And uh, of course, we all know that um, research impact could gain from zero to four stars. And our university selected um, case studies very well. So all case studies uh, received four stars, uh, including mine. So I was very pleased about that. And as um, Lise mentioned, the um, university grant committee decided to demonstrate how well their money spent in terms of impact. And so they published this, um, I don't know, a brochure or um, small book um, to publicize what they have been doing. And um, I was really pleased because uh, only my case from education was selected um, uh, to this um, book. And uh, you can see here um, is the photos from my workshop I had in, um, Guangzhou for uh, representatives of vocational education um, ministries and Tibet institutions uh, from the region. They're all members of the Columba Plan Staff College. There are 15 members in that um, international organization, so they were all present there. And then they um, start implementing some ideas that they picked up, for example, during this um, workshop. And um, now this case, when I'm talking how you can plan for your impact, it relates to the external motivation, but it is still a good thing to do. But uh, I, I, I think I was uh, lucky because I have been working with them, international organizations and in their um, mission, they have um, uh, the statement that relates to development of the countries. Yes, so they are not focusing on research per se, but they are focusing on developing of the countries. So whenever I worked with these international organizations, more or less automatically this development happens and the impact happens. And um, I just want to show you the types of questions or statements that are required to include in your case study. And um, I think that if you think without these categories or have these categories in mind when you are planning your research or referring, reflecting back on your research, then um, you can prepare um, this impact case in your head and then uh, it would be easier to put it on paper when required. So the first part uh, relates to evidence of research significance and quality. And uh, if you don't know, my main focus here, since I moved them um, to uh, Education University of Hong Kong, was um, related to skills that can support um, implementation of sustainable development agenda. And that means that it mainly relates to technical and vocational education sector. And uh, of course, now climate change and sustainable development are big issues on agenda. So all research that relates to that is really important and considered as important by the governments. So um, I, I worked on research um, projects supported by UNESCO Asian Development Bank, Bank, APEC, and also I had a GRF grant supported by Hong Kong government that contributes to that as well. And uh, you can see here a small figure, which is the typology of green skills, because I was focusing on skills and particularly I was focusing on the second level from the bottom, bottom, which is generic green skills. And for that one, I developed the typology, I developed um, a different ways of an addressing these skills, designing courses and curriculum to develop these skills. And um, this is the uniqueness of research because no one else have been doing that. So that sort of relates to solution to the um, 
uh, problem. Yes, and groundbreaking knowledge or the knowledge or insights, as I, I said, um, no one else has been doing that. And then the area of impact and the beneficiaries. So in my case, I presented impact at different levels. So the first level was Tibet policy debate and practice in Asia Pacific region. And um, of course, we all used to present at them academic conferences, but um, and it can uh, stimulate and contribute to debate, but it is uh, better to present at them conferences or events where the government officials are invited or where these international organizations organizing something for the practitioners. So I have been doing that um, extensively for a long period of time. And then the second area was strategic development plans, like um, all international organizations, they develop their like 10 year plans. And if we're talking about Asian Development Bank, 34 member countries, of course, will be under influence of this strategic development plan. And uh, as I mentioned, this Columba Plan Staff College, 15 member states. So I contribute to both um, strategic development plans that are still in force. And uh, there we include this greening agenda. So now whenever Asian Development Bank sponsoring some projects, this greening element now they have on the agenda so that um, have a very yeah, strong potential to be included in these projects. Then at the policy level, national policy level, and I included example of Mongolia. So they um, included greening of Tibet into the national program for Tibet. And as a result, of course, it will impact Tibet system, institutions, students, that will be a direct impact. And then indirect will be industry, environment, and society. And then the level of practice, a number of Tibet um, institutions that change their curriculum or improve their curriculum. So that uh, had an impact on Tibet students, industry, environment, and society. And then uh, important questions, how have you been engaged to enable this knowledge transfer? And um, as I mentioned, the workshops for the ministry representatives and um, development of policy briefs and expert meetings and participation in advisory meetings. And um, also, uh, yes, policy briefing workshop for Mongolian Ministry of Labor and also capacity development workshops for Tibet leaders and even <clears throat> Tibet leaders from North Korea. I did it in September 2019 after this was submitted, but now they are coming back to UNESCO. They want to continue. And uh, also in Singapore, I was a member of the Academic Quality Committee for the Institute of Adult Learning in Singapore. And um, after the meeting, they put it in the minutes that we need to consider how to include greening element into our courses. And evidence of impact. So um, it is sort of assumed evidence when we're talking about the strategic development plans by ADB and uh, Columbia Plan Staff College. It is assumed that because they have it on the agenda, it will influence the country, member countries. And then also I had testimonials from Mongolia, China, and Nepal. Also in report on the project for ADB, we had the statement about um, how, um, uh, how our research influence, what ADB will be doing. And then, as I mentioned before, attendance of the policy advisory meetings that um, end up in developing these uh, strategic plans. And then the minutes of the meeting in Singapore. Yeah, so further deliberate on suggestions to include. So I collected these statements and they were included as available into the uh, case study. And here, this is the questions, not, not questions, but um, examples. Uh, of what sort of evidence you can uh, collect. And for 
um, my current case, um, I didn't um, collect statistical evidence. Yes, we can only um, approximate how many institutions or how many um, people will be impacted. But if we go back to the case from Russia, then it is very easy to do the statistical evidence of benefits because we know um, we know how many textbooks, for example, were published, and then uh, how many regions bought this um, textbook, how many students were involved. And now I want um, to share with you one model that um, <clears throat> is called knowledge exchange and impact model. And that might help you to plan your future impact. And of course, it is based on your on the external motivation that we all have now. But I think that if you accept this and um, if you develop your mindset in terms of it is really important, yes, because why we're doing research to improve our society. Yes, and even we, now, now we, many of us are teaching this subject, which is called philosophical and sociological issues of education. And when uh, we're talking about five um, philosophical orientations towards education, one is social reconstructivism. Yes, and it really focused on how to make the life of society better in different aspects, including environmental aspects. So now we'll go through this <coughs> model just to show um, the examples. Yes, I, I think that to find collaborators is really important. So in the first case, Russian case, I found the like-minded people who wanted to try and who believe that it is a good idea and that it is required for Russia at that stage. For my next um, uh, level of research, I was involved with several networks like um, UNESCO Univoc network and then um, Rafter network, then international and local. And so it is very easy to um, share your ideas through these networks. Yes, and if you have um, partners that are focusing on development, of course, it is uh, very, very important. For example, this year I start working with GIZ, which is the German um, development agency. And they were really interested and they asked me to present at the end of the year conference because now they're all talking about greening and they need to include this into their projects worldwide. So they really wanted to understand what does it mean. And um, yeah, and um, yeah, that, that, that's very important. Also, I think that we can use the potential of our PhD students. And I didn't think about that before, but now when I was preparing for my presentation, I was thinking that both recent and current PhD students, Christy and um, Aisuhan, they all have their studies based on intervention. So we are using the ideas and resources that we developed through <clears throat> the project here, and then they applied it uh, in different settings. Christy applied it at um, uh, vocational um, VTC, Vocational Training Council in Hong Kong, the, the changing their pedagogy in delivering the module on that can develop generic green skills. And Isohan applied it with, uh, and when she was working with um, refugees, mothers, so to develop their understanding of um, environmental issues, helping them to develop skills, how to recycle products and also uh, give them knowledge and understanding that they could um, set up a social enterprise. So in the future, when um, they will be legally, <clears throat> it will be a legal opportunity for them to uh, develop that, they would be able to do that. And of course, visibility and uh, audiences. So um, I think that I haven't, um, presented a lot of my research within our institution because not a lot of people are doing research that relates to vocational education and training. But um, so I was sort of pushed on this naturally happens to work with a much bigger international audience um, 
that were interested in um, this type of research, and particularly these UNESCO Univoc centers, there are more than 200 around the world that are interested. But in your case, you need to make sure that um, what you are doing is visible and you know who is your audience. And then use and users. So translation very often is really important. For example, textbooks in Russia, they were translated into Tatar language because we have the autonomous um, Tatar area in, in Russia and they wanted to have it in their language. And uh, now, for example, I'm just starting another project that relates to uh, funded by UNESCO and materials we sent already to our participants that are translated in Chinese. <clears throat> And they will be translated in Mongolian also and Arabic, so three more languages. And um, <clears throat> intended and potential users, it is important to include in our research design. And I know that when we're applying for GRF, we have this um, section on impact and the knowledge transfer. But really, it, um, of course, it could be a separate section, but it should be in your mind from the very beginning of um, your research design, because uh, otherwise it would be difficult just to add on at the end uh, of something. <clears throat> Beneficiaries, yes, you need to identify. And then diffusion. Um, here there is, um, one issue, of course, that long-lasting impact is difficult to trace. But uh, the longer we introduce something or expose um, a society or different societies to the particular ideas, the more effect we have, but the more difficult it is to trace back to one particular research. Yes. For example, I was the first person who designed them framework for greening Tibet for UNESCO when I was on um, uh, working for UNESCO Paris, still from Australia. But then the person who, uh, for example, took over the um, International Center of UNESCO Univo, he published it, it, it added, changed, and now it is known as he introduced it. Yes. So, but I, I never had any Sort of problem with that, but I'm just an example. Sometimes it's difficult to trace it to the origin. And here I want also to thank our university. I had a crack project that was um, developing these resources that we have been using in training um, in uh, Christie's, Isohan's research, but also in training across the region and now internationally. So um, we developed this website where we start putting these resources. We're still putting additional ones, but um, I think there is also, from my perspective, a small issue with the CRAC project because originally I set it up as um, international, as a project that will have um, international impact at the heart of it. But then I was said, no, CRAC project should mainly uh, be beneficial to Hong Kong society. So, of course, I changed it because it's also important to benefit Hong Kong society. But um, I think that maybe considering that uh, we want to be international university, maybe at least to allow like 50-50 impact on Hong Kong and 50% international or regionally, I think that would be better for future developments. And then uh, recently I used these resources to train Tibet leaders in Indonesia. And then I put it um, <clears throat> um, as an application towards Dean's um, research award on engagement and impact. And I won it last year, so I was very happy about that. And now the new project that I mentioned also with um, Univoc Network, and you can see the number of countries that would be involved. And it is a capacity building project for addressing sustainable development goals through curriculum and pedagogy innovation in Tibet. And again, it is built on the resources that we designed through this CRAC project. So I think it is really important to have your 
agenda, like long-term agenda, and you can add and then impact just naturally will grow up. Because if you are changing your direction all the time, it would be really difficult, I think, to achieve the impact. And uh, here, this is just the members who will benefit from this project that we are about to start. And they're all Univox centers. And um, you can see that we have um, uh, Tibet institutions, but we also have government agencies in Saudi Arabia and the Philippines. So we will have an impact on a different level. So the plan is to have an impact at the government level. And in Saudi Arabia, they want to change their curriculum for greening. In um, Philippines, they started it already because we've had a number of projects with this agency already over the years, but they want to renew, update, et cetera, et cetera. And these um, polytechnics and um, colleges of um, technology, they want to make sure that their curriculum is getting greener as a result of that project. And you can see different categories of people that um, are involved in the project. And in the long run, of course, it will benefit TVET, uh, TVET students in terms of their green skills development to support sustainable development agenda. And in Mongolia, you can see this is a different type of institution. It is NGO that is working with the government and working with some um, vocational education institutions. So it's bringing them together and they will be participating in the project. I think that our university really um, supports our effort in terms of knowledge transfer. And I attended the presentation um, my head of department sent me to attend, and I think it is really interesting, but of course I'm not an expert on that. So if you have questions, you need to ask our knowledge transfer office. And uh, <clears throat> these three, uh, three uh, funds that are available for us, I think you can use to um, um, start up or to incorporate in your research for the knowledge transfer. And uh, you can see the first one relates to prototype of innovation. And the second one, any innovation that relates to hardware or software and the fits that relates to community benefits. And actually within the Univox Center now, we are uh, thinking to apply for this one. So we can work with NGOs in Hong Kong, again, based on the resources that we have and organizing this workshop, showing them how to recycle, for example, um, coffee that we used um, in coffee machines, how we can recycle them into a scrap. Uh, so it will be a beauty product or how we can change used oil into candles. So these simple things, but for them, uh, people who doesn't have a lot of income, that could be an interesting opportunity to, to set up a um, social enterprise and um, have some money, have some funding as a result of their work. And also I did studies with um, uh, companies here in Hong Kong. And for example, hotels said that we want to recycle our um, so, but we don't have a lot of um, companies that will accept that. And I interviewed one hotel and they said before we did that, but then this company closed. So now we can't do this. So it's really important to support these small and medium enterprises in um, uh, Hong Kong. And so we're thinking about that one. And this is just uh, a little bit more details about each uh, fund that is available and uh, you can see them, I can't comment on them. I just put them here so you have very generic idea. And for example, uh, late March will be a deadline for that. So there is still time to think how you can do that. And um, then this is the example. It's innovative prototype to transform and present meditation to the public through the digital and interactive platform, which target to schools and general public. So I guess, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it is solar based. Um, 
and this tech technological fund uh we missed the deadline but you can plan for the next year and now of course we are using a lot of artificial intelligences big data blockchain all these um, uh, technological developments we can use for transferring knowledge that we gain for our research and here you can see an example of um, how to create music composition and i was not um, uh, aware before why is it important but then i realized because of the copyright so if it is created by artificial intelligence technology then basically this is um, uh, no copyright attached to the just to ensure that there is no copyright attached to the uh, particular composer and this one that attracts my attention uh, relates to poverty and social exclusion and uh, uh, we already identified a number of NGOs that we will address with that. And again, call for applications is tentatively in March 2022. And um, this is the example that has been funded already by our university, you can see Disabled Association of Hong Kong. And um, uh, here it was the relationship between art technology and social exclusion. And so they just um, focusing on the disabled um, minorities, yes, to learn the basic uh, formation of Chinese characters. Yeah, very interesting one. So I think that I will um, stop here. I don't know to what extent I met your expectations, but I was thinking that um, our session was uh, designed as a sh sharing session. So I will. Um, I guess, Liz, now everything is in your hands. Well, great, thank you so much. Uh, I think that was really interesting. Yes, I was hoping for, for some sharing about your journey. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, really impressive work, really interesting and multidimensional. Uh, also, I think it's very helpful that you gave a lot of sort of hints about how other people who might not know much about knowledge exchange could do more of that in the future. So thank you so much for that. Um, and now we have time for any questions anyone has. <laughs>